Welcome to DIY Video and Audio for Instructors. I'm Stephanie Mackley. I'm a senior editor and producer at Digital Learning Services. And my colleague, Betsy Greer, will present into the middle of this. So you might be able to see her waving now. Um, we're really happy that you're here. Um, and we're gonna cover a lot of information really quickly so that we'll leave time, a good healthy amount of time for Q&A at the end. Um, we are, um, because we're recording this, stay tuned because we'll share it with you so you can rewatch uh, later um, since we are going to move quickly. And um, we will also be monitoring questions in the chat throughout and we'll answer them there as we can. And then um, we'll, like I said, have time for Q&A at the end and possibly a pause in the middle for a couple of questions. So welcome to the buffet. <laughs> Um, we want you to think of this entire uh, workshop as a buffet, take what you want, leave what you don't like. Um, there's going to be a lot of information coming at you. And the last thing we want for you to be is overwhelmed. We are just trying to give you a sense of all of the options and um, support that's available to you. And we just really want you to benefit as much as you can in uh, 55 minutes from our, our media teams combined, like 20 plus years of experience supporting faculty and instructors with uh, DIY audio and video. So take what you want, leave the rest. I'm gonna start today by talking about media planning, um, which is essentially all the stuff that you should be thinking about before you even think about recording anything. Um, so that's what I will cover. Um, then Betsy will step in and cover some nuts and bolts, uh, some basic nuts and bolts of audio and video setup and recording and editing. So like I said, this is gonna be, we're gonna get busy. So whether you are thinking about synchronous or asynchronous methods for uh, the coming semester, all of these tips will help you. It's not like um, they only apply to one or the other. And as you may have heard, or if you haven't, hear it now, um, in terms of online instruction and remote instruction, a combination of synchronous and asynchronous teaching methods is ideal. Um, and we find that again and again in all of our work that we do uh, with helping instructors with design fully online courses or helping folks in a DIY um, special COVID edition, <laughs> uh, we find that that is still true. And as you know, like synchronous lectures, they're familiar, they're sturdy and they get the job done. So, you know, like a tugboat, like it's there for you when you need it. And then as we've all learned from the new COVID reality and certainly with last fall's fire season, which will probably circle around again, um, we can really benefit from being more adaptable and nimble. And that is asynchronous. Um, and we can get a little bit more into that um, as I discuss, but you know, the chameleon is our friend. So in terms of asynchronous lectures, I always like to share this post that Ken Worthy shared on TeachNet um, sometime last semester. Um, and the title of it was Liking Recorded Lectures, What? Um, we encounter this all the time. I, I know that it's counterintuitive to a lot of you that that would be something that a student would like. And yet, uh, Ken said that by far the most common comment that that he got was that they like the asynchronous recorded lectures. Who knew? And the short answer to that is we knew. <laughs> and we're really hoping that all of you will be willing to give it a try because um, it works. Uh, Ken's, Ken's students specifically liked being able to rewind, rewatch lectures. Um, they really liked the flexibility to finish their readings before watching the lecture. So being able to pace themselves as they needed to so they could complete all the reading. And um, he, was, he was shocked to know that some, some of the students even watched the videos twice. So he said that his mid-course surveys were, if anything, better than what he usually gets when he's teaching on the ground. Mm -hmm. So just know that like there's hope. There's hope in this weird universe that we are all involved in now. And also you may have noticed that the, uh, the task force and instructional resilience recommended after the fires that we prepare to deliver two weeks of content remotely. And ha ha ha, that's funny because now we deliver everything remotely all the time. Um, but the thing that we recommend is um, 
if you are nervous about asynchronous um, content, consider having this semester be a time that you can think about how you would prepare your three last lectures to be delivered uh, asynchronously. Because then regardless of what sort of interruption might come in the future for these courses that you teach again and again, you'll be you'll know you have this bank of asynchronous material that you can rely on if you lose class time because of a fire or a shutdown or whatever else might be coming our way. And my other recommendation that I, if, there, if you remember nothing else <laughs> that comes from my section of this, uh, this workshop, record all of your lectures this fall, record all of them. That is material that you can edit later into asynchronous content. And that's what Ken Worthy used for his emergency run <laughs> of his course, um, COVID style. He used previous, he used lecture capture and then Zoom recordings of his lectures. And that's what he edited together. And that's what his students watched twice. So this do, you do not have to get fancy. Okay, um, Kaltura. I'm sure you're all hearing about Kaltura. Um, we are barely going to touch the tip of the iceberg on Kaltura today, and we want to focus our time on these other uh, media planning and nuts and bolts. So please just know there are multiple trainings for Kaltura that are available at the through the Academic Innovation Studio where you signed up for this workshop. Um, and we're gonna leave some links for you in the chat so that you can easily access those. But I just want us all to have a common understanding out of the gates that Kaltura is a video management tool that you have now at UC Berkeley and it's directly connected with your B courses site. So, Faculty can use Kaltura to record, store, and share media for asynchronous use in their courses. That is what it is for. So it is different than Zoom. It is not a live synchronous tool. It is for use for recording, storing, and sharing asynchronously. And um, Betsy will cover a bit more about editing with Kaltura um, as we get into that section. I wanna start by talking about parsing, which is always the way that I start thinking about planning media for a, an online or remote course. And parsing is a way of segmenting your lectures that increases online student engagement and that matches your content with media types. So why should you bother parsing? Um, the first reason is that we know that shorter segments help students engage online. So this is from a video specific study um, back, I think it's, I think this is now six years old or maybe a little older, but it's the largest, it was the largest scale study of video engagement to date. And they use data from 6.9 million video watching sessions across four edX courses. Um, and you can see that engagement really does start to fall off after six minutes. What this does not mean is that you need to now carve up your lecture into six minute sections. All it means is that you want to think more in terms of like segments and sort of, yes, you'd want to think about chunking your lectures up. Um, and that is not just about time length, which I'll discuss, discuss later, but it's just helpful to see some data. So it's not though, just about chopping up your lecture into sections um, like this pineapple. What parsing is about is it, it's about matching your content with fitting media types. And in doing that, you naturally get shorter segments because not all of your lecture that you give on ground is necessarily best suited for a single media type. So it's designed to elevate, parsing is about elevating your material. So it's just like cooking, you know, you're thinking about, you know, what is your audience going to enjoy eating the most? <laughs> um, and so you're just, you're trying to convert that content and let it elevate itself depending on the media type that you choose. So media types. I, I, when I talk about media types, as I go through all of these types, I want you to think first as I'm talking about what and how you communicate your lectures. And as you're thinking later and planning the semester, think about what and how you communicate before you decide on a media type. That's the biggest first mistake people make is they're like, oh, I'm going to do everything in video. Well, maybe not actually. Um, there's a lot of different tools and uh, media that you can use. So I'm going to run through those now. If you're storytelling a lot, 
um, in your course, then talking head video or audio only podcast style is perfect for you. Oh, and here we go. Yeah. Um, so your talking head video, you want to use video specifically if your expression, gestures, or surroundings are essential in what you need to communicate. And so this is a sample from Laura Nelson's um, Gender, Race, Nation, and Health course that she ran this summer for the first time. And she recorded all of these uh, just a couple of months ago with her laptop around campus. I'm going to play a quick sample here for you. And a quiz. Your research project proposal is also due, so make sure this is something you're really interested in looking into. In fact, in your proposal, you need to say why this is interesting. So obviously, Laura is not storytelling here. She's actually just giving a bunch of like logistical overview information for the particular segment of her course. But she is she wanted to be on campus because she knew students would be missing campus. And so that's why I use this here. You don't have to be like some master storyteller to use video, but the, the visual here is essential. So that's why I think this is a good example of how to use it. And also notice that this is just a minute and 40 seconds long. So I think that's a really excellent targeted use of video. Um, audio only podcast style. Please consider this. It's an excellent option. Um, it's for use if sounds like archival media, arch archival audio, media clips, and music are essential. And this is the special part, if visuals are not essential. So if, if you're thinking about your lecture and if you don't use a slide deck and if you don't tend to use visuals, go for audio only podcast or strongly uh, consider it. This is again, Laura Nelson recording at home during COVID um, and I'm gonna play you just a short segment of this. You're listening to Gender, Race, Nation and Health. I'm Professor Laura Nelson. And today I'm talking about, what if we think of genes as the blueprints for building our bodies? Okay, so this is obvious. We all know what a podcast podcast is. And um, it's just a great, it's a great option for you um, because also the file sizes are extremely small and much easier to download and share. So there you have it. If you're lecturing with slides, graphics, or doing um, on-screen demos with like search engines or websites or anything like that, then screen recording is your friend. Um, this is obviously if those things are essential and you need to show them. And here is a sample from Abigail DeKosnick's uh, performance television and social media course. Some of these people in person ever to have a strong social tie to them eventually. Here are some images of Tilda Swinton's 2003. Okay, so obviously that is pretty self-explanatory. You can use text and video or photos on your slides and record them. Um, annotating slides. If you uh, need to explain things that are like whiteboard style or annotate slides that you have, you want to record your uh, tablet screen while you're writing. Um, and this is a very common um, use case for math courses, physics courses, stats courses, things like that. But obviously there's other conditions in which you'd want to do it. Um, here is a sample from Sanjay Govindji's uh, Introduction to Solid Mechanics course. Uh, it's folded into a little documentary style testimonial that we produced. So you'll hear him talking about his experience. I was really concerned about whether the students would be able to learn the material in the setting where they're just watching a screen. But I think what I did learn at the end of the day was that they're just like your in-class students. So what he goes on to say there is they're just like your in-class students. There's ones that do super well, there's the middle pack that do fine, and then there's the ones that have a tricky time. So it's pretty much the same. And obviously you saw his annotations there. Um, if you're gonna be talking to subject matter experts, which is a really easy thing to port into this online space through Zoom, then you just wanna record Zoom conversations. Um, this can be audio or video. I always like to remind folks of this because Zoom will default to recording the video and audio. But um, I really recommend if there is nothing that's visually compelling about your conversation other than just your faces, 
um, I tend to uh, like to do like a five minute video of like the beginning of the conversation so you can get oriented and then let the rest be audio because it's that small file. And because most of us, when we're watching a video where there's no new visual information, we just stop watching it anyway and we start listening. So it's a way that your students can actually more deeply engage um, with material uh, if they're just listening to it, because it gives them more freedom to say, peruse any supplementary materials like PDFs or slide decks that you've allowed them to look at so that it makes their media uh, viewing experience or listening experience more interactive. And here's just a quick top tip for any video that you're gonna record. Um, try to add visual signposts so that your students can find specific sections when they're re-watching or skimming the video later. So just like Ken Worthy said, his students really liked being able to go back. You notice how in this presentation, I'm creating these very different um, high contrast visual slides when I shift to a different topic area. Um, you can easily do that if you're doing your screen recording um, and lecturing to slides. And then if you're not, um, it's a pretty basic editing move that you can take to even add uh, those visuals in on top of, um, say, a talking head lecture, if that's the way you're going. And this is another like great takeaway, text is a media type, you guys, and it's one of the most interactive media types there is. So again, when we port into online, everyone tends to just think about video. Text is a fabulous use of, it's a, it's a fabulous thing to parse your lecture into. And it might not feel that way, but I'll explain why. Um, so in this case, this is just a sample from Eula Taylor's uh, Modern History of so History of Modern Civil Rights course, and she uses the course pages to convey a lot of her lecture material that are um, in list form. I also recommend using text if you have a lot of statistics that you cover in lecture or any material that really needs time to absorb. Um, I think that as we have recorded a lot of media over our years, what we find again and again is that uh, statistics, lists, and, and again, material that needs time, it doesn't work as well. Students don't engage and really get into that if it's just spoken to them on a screen or in an audio only format. So you can easily segment out those bits and create them as um, B courses pages. You can also, if you don't wanna, if you don't wanna deal with B courses pages, you can also, um, just create a Google Doc and link to that in your in your B courses or a PDF link. It can be in any format, um, but it's a really great way to, again, minimize the the length of these chunks and then giving your students a blend of ways to engage with your lecture material. Um, image. Oh, and one other thing I want to say that always comes up. People say, "Well, so if I make it text, does that turn it into a reading? Like, because this is my lecture." No, in the online world text that your students are reading that is lecture material, just think of that as lecture. Um, don't think of it as reading because it's just the media type that you're using to deliver your lecture to them. So when you think about carving up those time segments, that's, that's how to think about text from your lecture. Images are a media type. Um, there's a tool that we all have access to through the UC subscription to Adobe Cloud. It's called Spark. And it allows you to, um, to create a pretty sexy looking scrollable uh, presentation so that you can basically take your slide deck, um, any other uh, like videos that you show in a particular lecture and integrate them all in this sort of a uh, format. Um, this is from Leslie Lesko's um, biology class. And she created this um, during the, the, power outages uh, during the fires last year. And I just like to show it because you can see how it's quite lovely. It's very interactive. Students can go at their own pace. They can easily go back, find information that they needed and review it. And also um, it allows really seamless integration of YouTube videos. So it's just you know loaded in here and they can just play it exactly from this space. So consider this, this is, this is a fancier option, um, I'm not gonna lie. It takes a little bit of time to learn, but it's also been designed by Adobe to be a pretty 
uh, intuitive space that you're not gonna have to spend a ton of time learning. And I'd also like to talk just briefly about scripts and outlines. Um, this is often a big point of contention when we work with instructors, um, especially about recording uh, asynchronous media. I get that thinking of writing a script for your lecture might make you want to die, um, but I promise you that scripts and outlines will actually save your life um, for recording asynchronous media. So the reason they're amazing is because you're gonna, when you record, you're gonna hit all of your points guaranteed. You're not gonna have to go back and record something later that you forgot because you can plan it out. Um, also, your recording and editing, editing time is greatly decreased because you're, if, especially if you have a script um, that you're reading and maybe doing a little bit of ad-libbing off of, um, you're not gonna make as many mistakes. Um, and then you're not gonna have to go back and edit those mistakes out. Um, the other thing that I always say is a bonus is that it makes parsing easier. Um, and I will explain why. So there is a voice typing tool in Google Docs that I highly encourage you to check out. Um, it's in the tools uh, menu and it's called voice typing. And when you click on the little um, menu option, you get this uh, recording button and you just hit record and then suddenly Google starts typing everything that you say. Um, you can deliver a lecture that you could deliver by heart probably to me right now into Google Docs. It writes it down for you. You could even record yourself uh, delivering that lecture so that you have the asynchronous media and then afterwards you have the script to use later if you ever need it. But then the other great thing about this script or any outlines that you already use to deliver your lectures is you use that paper uh, document, that outline or that script to help you think about this parsing process and to help you think, oh yeah, this is the stats part. This should be a Google Doc that I let them all read. This should be the audio part because there's I don't use any slides for this whole 30 minutes. And then this should be the screen capture because that is where I use all my slides. So that's uh, that's one of the reasons why really thinking about this in outline or script form is helpful. And if you are gonna perform for an asynchronous uh, lecture, um, then I really encourage you to test out whether script or outline is best for your performance. Um, obviously, if you're recording audio only, scripts are dreamy because you can just like read them or uh, outlines are dreamy for you if you don't like to read and perform that way and you just prefer to ad lib. Um, but if you are recording video, um, I, I really want you to think about eye contact and how it really makes a difference. You notice um, in this environment, whether I'm looking down here and like kind of talking to you, but looking here or whether I'm looking at the camera and at the little dot that's lit up on my camera, you can tell it's like, oh my God, she's looking at me. Like there's some human connection here. So if you're recording video, you wanna find out where the lens of your camera is and whatever de recording device you're using and figure out how you can look at that more often um, than not. Also, I have the clock here just because the issue we find with outlines is you'll think that, oh yeah, this is gonna take me 20 minutes. And then you use the outline, you record it, and it's like 35 minutes. So the joy of a script is that you can check the word count of your script. Um, the average human being uh, talking at a pretty normal rate is about 180 words per minute. So you can figure out how long your lecture is that way. And also there is this uh, fabulous software that's free and online called teleprompt.me. And we use it, you should use it. Uh, you basically can upload your outline or your script into it. Um, it probably would work better with a script. And what it does is it will follow your voice and it will scroll the text for you. And you can uh, have the window be right up by where your camera lens is so that that eye contact thing is taken care of. And it really will help you with your performance if you practice with it a little bit. Hi, everybody. Stuff did a great job of laying out the roadmap on what you need to do beforehand. And now I'm going to walk you through the aspect of when you're ready to record and then some post-production tips. All right. so. Audio. Audio is the most important aspect of any media. Uh, so your video might look really, really great, but if students can't hear you, it doesn't count for anything. All is lost. So this includes podcasts, interviews, lectures. Good audio is very important. Um, 
And then what uh, I would say is um, on my next screen, we have a couple of different mics uh, that we say consider using. Um, I'm actually using the desktop mic today, this mic. Um, I also have AirPods that I switch in between from. Um, and then this is called a lavalier mic. Um, and that's like what you could use if you're using your phone instead of um, connected to your camera. I would say if you're using the headphones with the um, microphone that's attached right here, I would just be a little bit careful of that because um, I have a collar on my shirt today. And if I had that microphone that was right here, it would bump up against here and you would not be aware of that, but your students would be aware of that. So that's just something to um, think about. Your camera um, mic is sufficient, but um, if you're planning and thinking about this, I would say maybe take it one step further. Um, uh, Bluetooth headphones work as well. Um, I just want you guys to think about um, how you're using your audio. Um, I've been in, um, previous to Berkeley, I used to do um, audio recording for major networks. And if basically, if my I didn't do my job properly, we were all in trouble. So audio is very, very important. Um, and then the best place to record audio only um, lectures, podcasts, whatever, is actually in a closet or under blankets. Um, sound waves bounce off of hard surfaces and your whole goal is to dampen those sound waves. Um, so this is a picture of Anna Kendrick um, and she was doing at home um, audio recording and you can see that she has like a blanket fort going on. So I just wanted to show this image to say this is not just some like weird digital learning services um, thing that we're suggesting. This is actually an industry standard that if you're recording at home, we suggest that you um, go somewhere where the sound waves will be dampened because that is actually the best way to get um, audio quality. Um, so I want you to think about um, spaces in your house, bedrooms, closets, blanket forts, um, rooms with carpeting, possibly bedrooms. Um, they're really great spaces to dampen those audio waves. Um, so I took that image of Anna Kendrick and I built my own at home uh, recording studio, audio recording studio. Uh, I have hardwood floors and I have a wooden desk. Um, so I laid a blanket down on top of the wooden desk and then I put another blanket over the top of me and did an audio recording that way. Um, it was pretty hot, but the audio sounded really good. So, you know, sometimes we have to suffer for our craft. Um, but the audio was good. So um, just think about what you have at your home and then that what you could use uh, to get the best audio quality possible. And then uh, I want you to listen to your surroundings. When you choose the room that you're going to record in, whether it be just for audio or if it's for video and audio, just sit in that room. Listen to the noise of that room. Can you hear fans? Um, can you hear other people in your house from other rooms? Um, is there a leaf blower outside? Uh, I tend to not be able to record in the afternoon because we tend to have gardeners in our neighborhood that blow their leaf blowers. So I know that's not a great time for me. So I just want you to listen to the sound of that room and what is the noise? Uh, if there are fans running, can you turn them off? Um, I live in a tiny house and I have a refrigerator behind me. So unfortunately that goes off every once in a while and that's not something I can help, but just listen to your surroundings. Um, yep, exactly what I said. Sit in your room where you're going to record and listen to the noise of the room. Um, fan and leaf blowers. All right, so now we're gonna move to on camera. Um, and on camera is, Think of the same audio techniques that we gave, but now we're gonna add a whole nother element, which is what we can see. 
Um, recording with a camera. Um, so when I say recording with a camera, I'm going to use a um, phone and your computer camera simultaneously. I'm going to go back and forth. Um, like Steph so um, eloquently put in the beginning of this, have a script and outline or slides to follow. You have your different mic options, the desktop mic, the AirPods, Bluetooth, lavaliers. Um, and then I suggest have the option to light um, use lighting that is available in your house, the windows, lamps. Um, and then this can also be a great activity for your kids or your family members to help with the framing of your shot. We're going to talk about depth. And then if you're a little lost on um, like how to use your house or what you're going to do, I suggest watching um, TV, because right now at the moment, everybody's recording at home. HD TV, they're recording at home late night. Um, talk show hosts are recording at home. The news is recording at home. Um, the Real Housewives of New York City are recording at home. So just look at um, how they're recording at home as well. And then that maybe may pique some interest in how to use your house or things in your house um, to help you record as well. Um, so once you start thinking about um, recording at home, uh, there's a whole performative aspect, which I know you guys have nailed that in the classroom, but now it's different because you're just talking to a lens and that's not the same. So what we suggest is that you find your authentic voice. Um, you know, you know the subject material. Now it's awkward just talking to this camera lens. Now you need to think about your authentic voice and how you wanna address your students. Um, we can hear a smile. So just be authentic. Um, it's gonna, I promise you, it will get better. The first couple of times you do this and you probably felt this way last spring, it's weird and it's awkward, but it will get better and we, um, the students and who's ever on the other side will start to, to get that and hear your authenticity. It just takes practice. Um, what, I what I suggest is that like when you hit that record button, pause, take a breath, just center yourself and picture who you're talking to, picture your students and then go into your lecture and get comfortable like this is your home. You don't have to be all dressed up like you are when you're at, in the lecture halls. Um, so you can see from here up, from here up, but like I've got shorts and I don't have shoes on cause that's comfortable for me. So, um, you know, just think about what makes you comfortable. Sit in a really comfortable chair, maybe wear like that top that makes you feel really good, but make yourself comfortable because you're going to be here for a while. And this is like your way that you're going to be addressing your students. So, you know, have fun with it. Um, and then like Steph said earlier, eye contact, eye contact, eye contact. It's super important. You can have your script here, but just check in with the lens every once in a while. And then again, the teleprompt me script um, software is really, really great. Um, so you've got your performative aspect. You've thought about um, what you're going to shoot on. You've got your script. Now you got, oh, I got to like appear on screen. So for lighting, things to consider. Um, don't use overhead lights because it creates shadows underneath your eyes. And we don't want that. Um, use lamps or windows in your favor. And white sheets, walls, or blankets are great um, use to bounce light into your face. So um, if you have like a dark wooden surface underneath you and you feel like you're a little dark, just put a white sheet down It'll, and that'll do wonders. Um, and then things to remember is that your eye goes to the brightest spot in the frame. So think about where windows are located and then use them to your advantage. So um, I actually have that problem in my house. Um, as you can see in this video, I have these windows behind me. I'm in a dark corner. 
Um, so I've taken these three images of uh, myself. So this first one here on the left, that's no lighting and just those two bright windows behind me, not great. Um, you, can, you can't really see my face that much. We're fighting with this light. In the middle image, I set up a light on this side. So you can see a little bit light right there. You can see a little light in my eye right there. So that's better, it's getting better. This one is the best. So I still have the light set up over here and then I have a door on this side, I open the door and that's got light there. And now you can see I've got light in both of my eyes. Um, and that just really brightens and warms up your shot. Um, so like you can use table lamps, I, ha I have a portable light that I have over here. If you have like a bank of windows sit in front of them and let that light bounce on you, that's really great. Um, we can also say, just put a white, um, a white screen up in front of you and let that light bounce off the screen on your face. That's also a really great image. So you got your lighting, you've got your audio, your script, all that, and you're like, okay, now I gotta think about how I fit in the frame. And when we're talking about the frame, we're talking about right here, the frame that is provided by the camera. Um, how are you positioned in the frame? And what do you want your students to see, your surroundings? We're allowing students into our lives. And it's just like, how comfortable are you with what the students see? So we're gonna um, talk about all of this. But one thing I wanna just say is, I want you to own the frame. Don't let the frame own you. Um, that means I want you to be present in the frame. And um, we're going to do some uh, pointers on the next slide. So here's just a picture that I took of myself working at home. Um, the frame is owning me. I am not owning the frame in this shot. There's an electrical cord right there. There's my office mate. There's my bottles of water right there. And there's all this headroom. There's more of the frame than there is me. Um, this is not good, not good at all. So I want you to walk around your house and look for nice spots with good lighting and if possible, depth, meaning room behind you. And this is the point where you can use family members or kids to help you with this. Um, they can sit in or help you with ideas. So if you're walking around your house and, and, and you see a spot that might work, have um, somebody sit, sit in a chair and sit in that spot. And then you look at it and see how that works um, for you. And um, I would say if you, if you found a really great sweet spot in your house that has good lighting, the framing looks great, um, I would say take a picture of your setup once you hit that sweet spot and then that way you have a frame of reference to always return to because we all can't just leave this set up in our houses because we're living here so just um you know take a picture so you can always come back to it for when you have those lectures um so that's what i did i walked around my house i was like okay i live in a tiny house how am i going to do this i want depth I don't want students to see into my house. So what am I going to do? So I had my office mate. I, I walked around. I, I had a general idea what I wanted. So I had my office mate sit down and I was like, oh, this looks like a good spot back here, but there's like all of this. And I'm like, well, I don't want to show that. Um, so I framed it up so it would work for me. And this is a picture of me. So this is what it actually looked like when I was recording, but because of the framing and the lighting and everything, this is actually what came out of it. So um, I just want you to think of a different perspective in your house, make your space work for you. This, we don't, I don't want students to see this, but I don't mind if students see this, this is totally fine. There's light on my eyes right here. I've got light on my face. I've got depth behind me. And there's really not a hint of what is going on in my house. So just think about how to use your house to your advantage. And you, know, and you don't have to give that full window into your house to your students. You can just give a little window. Um, Post-production. 
Uh, editing, make sure all your assets, let's see your images, your audio, your video um, are labeled and stored on your computer and on the cloud. And we suggest um, Google Drive. Uh, so this is an example of how we on the media team work. So we have um, our files labeled over here, our base files of what they are. And then we have, I broke it down into lectures and then graphics. And then I broke those down into um, weekly modules. You can do a week, you can do a module. And then here's um, like my editing files. Um, technology is awesome, but it's also not awesome because computers break, things happen, things get lost. You're gonna work so hard to make these recordings. I would say put them in two different locations just in case something happens. And then that way you won't have gone to all that work in, in case something gets lost. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you're using Kaltura, everything goes into that My Media section and there's not foldering right now. It just gets all dumped there. So after a while, you're gonna get built up a media, a media, a media. So label, 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 label. So as you can see, this is Intro to Media Studies Module 4, Module 5, Module 6. Label, label, label. It will save yourself in the end. Um, and so, for example, Zoom makes that file Zoom underscore 01. Right away, relabel that. Intro Science Week 1, Intro Biology Week 2, whatever it is, just relabel that right away. Because if you just upload that onto B courses, it's just zoom underscore zero all over the place. So think about how you want all this labeled, label it, put it up onto B courses, make a copy, put it up on Google Drive. Uh, so we're suggesting two types of editing software, um, Kaltura and Adobe. Kaltura, it's not that robust, meaning there aren't that many bells and whistles. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can edit media created for B courses, and there's not that much to learn. I think we we're, we got it under control in about an afternoon. You just need to spend some time with it, but it's not that bad. The Adobe software, very, very robust, meaning there's a lot of bells and whistles and there's a lot to learn. You can edit images, video, audio, but you need to spend some time, a lot of time. <laughs> Um, so Adobe, very robust software. You can edit video with Rush or Premiere Pro. You can edit audition. Um, you can edit audio with Audition. You can edit images in Photoshop and InDesign. And then you also have Illustrator. It, when you download the desktop app, which by the way, all of this is free with your .berkeley.edu. When you download the um, desktop app, this is like the window that you get and you can pick and choose what you wanna download and what you wanna use. Um, Kaltura, this is um, a screenshot of the video editor in Kaltura. So if those of you have taken the Kaltura um, workshop, you've seen this before if you've been using it. Um, you can edit once uploaded into B courses. It's great for trimming heads and tails, meaning the beginning and ends of videos. It's pretty easy to learn and use. And then you can create hotspots, which are cl clickable objects that um, will take you to somewhere else. As you can see, um, there's like the edit and the trim. You can set in and out. You can cut this section out. You can add fades. Um, you can uh, select which camera or screen. So if you want your slides here and your face here, you can select all of that. Um, and again, it's pretty easy. You just spend a little bit of time in there. Not too bad. Um, and if you haven't taken the Kaltura stuff yet, I would say please take those um, at the AIS where you signed up for this one. Um, and then if you have any questions going forward about anything, there's a great repository of information on the Keep Teaching website. Um, and then here's our digital learning services um, information, myself, Steph, Laura's been managing um, the chat as well. And then Robert Hold is um, our senior visual designer. And then after this, you'll be getting some information from us. And uh, he made this great little handout about um, accessibility with colors and words and type. 
um, and all of that. Um, so this is us. Um, we have 10 minutes. Um, so Steph, if there's any questions or if you guys wanna unmute yourself and ask some questions, let's go for it. Great, I'd love to answer one question that came up in the chat um, just right off the bat. And I'm gonna share my screen again because the question was, um, I'm having trouble understanding how to manage all the media I might make for a lecture. How are students directed through what to do and when? Are there examples of B courses sites that can be looked at? So this is an excellent question. Um, yes, there are examples, and I'm going to show you how you can access that. Um, and also, it this is all public and shareable. So I'm finding instructors from like teeny tiny universities with like a ten thousand dollar endowment are like being like, "What do I do? I have no support." So these are things you can share with colleagues anywhere, and please do that because others should be benefiting from like all of this support that that we are enabled to have here. Um, so this is the website. If you click on this, there's a Berkeley Access Remote Instruction Guide, which has some extra stuff that Berkeley folks get to look at. The public access one is the Remote Instruction Guide, and that's what you can share with friends. Um, this is just, a, this is teaching you remote instruction through B courses. So you should look at this for instruction. And then in looking at this, you can see how you would organize your own B courses for online. So see how we land on this really nice welcome page and then everything's organized according to modules. Um, you can use the word module or it could just be, you know, sections or parts or units or however you do it in your class. But walking students through in this sort of synchronous way, um, in this sort of stepwise, sorry, not synchronous, but this stepwise organized way can be really helpful. Um, you in B courses can create these, <clears throat> create these outline pages where your students can look at an overview of the course. I mean, this is, this is essentially a repurposing of your syllabus. And then, <clears throat> And then when you get into the specific sections, um, you can create, you can port parts of your, um, your syllabus or even your lecture into this overview section. Then you can also include any learning objectives that you want to share with your students. And then also, um, so, and then you can also create other sections here. So for you, you might have um, readings and then you link to all of your readings like this. You could have um, uh, lecture media, like lectures, and then you would have a list here of uh, linked to your lectures. If you record in Kaltura, um, those thumbnail videos will just be right here embedded, uh, which is a really nice feature. And then you can also include um, any other supplemental materials like PDFs, um, or you can also set up quizzes in here. I mean, there's a lot that B courses can do and we're not going into that, but I just wanted you to see how you can set this up. You can also include Zoom links for your asynchronous, for your synchronous meetings in here as well. Um, so I think in that last, I tried to include Betsy's and my email addresses in the chat. Um, it was also on that last slide, but um, I'm Stephanie Mackley. I'm smackley at berkeley.edu. Um, Betsy's B. Greer at berkeley.edu. So if you do have follow-up questions, um, you can reach out to us. We'll try to help you as best we can. Um, we're all slammed, so, you know, bear with us. And um, the other thing, you know, we are always trying to compile best practices because you're the ones that are all in the trenches here doing this. So if you find like equipment, solutions, like, you know, things that you wanna share, obviously I know folks are doing that on TeachNet, but we're trying to compile uh, best practices um, and share those from the Keep Teaching website. So if you ever wanna just drop us a line and say, oh my gosh, this works so great. Um, feel free, we will absolutely um, compile and share. Thank you all so much. Keep us posted. Good luck out there, kids. <laughs> <laughs>